Hello, my name is Melissa Gardner and I'm a middle school math teacher and I'm currently teaching seventh grade. Um, and it is wonderful to be here with Yasmina Martos. Would you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little about what you do? Sure, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Yasmina Martos and I'm a scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm a physicist and I work studying planets, uh, planets in the solar system, and that includes Earth, our home, and other planets like Jupiter or Mars. Awesome. So exciting. It's really thrilling for me to get to chat with you about what you do and how it relates to what I do. Um, so last week, um, I sent you some of the content standards that we cover uh, in middle school math. And so I thought we could just chat for a minute about how those things directly relate to what you do, because engaging students can be a challenge, especially if they don't understand the relevancy of what they're learning. And of course, every math teacher knows that um, we often hear the question, when am I ever going to use this? So that it's really nice to um, have somebody who is a career scientist talk about how the math that um, we're teaching them right now, you use it in your job. So first one we talked about was equations. Tell us about how you use equations. Well, first, uh, let me tell you that I use math every single day so physics is about describing nature right and we try to describe nature using equations laws right and um, one of the missions that i'm involved is the juno mission which is a spacecraft that is orbiting jupiter right now and we use a lot of equations to be able to send these spacecrafts to space or to the planetary body that we we want and i can share some slides if if you want to about yes this. i would like that okay so first can we talk about proportional relationships that's a pretty big focus in middle school of course and that it's very important um, of our solar system you know we have smaller and larger planetary bodies so let me uh, share uh, some slides with you yeah. um, where we can discuss this point. So if we talk about proportions, where well, let's first have an idea of, of our solar system, which we have the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So this is our home Earth, and Jupiter is the largest planet. So let's compare Jupiter, which is the largest planet on, on the solar system, with Earth. So talking about Jupiter, the mass of Jupiter is three times, uh, 318 times the mass of Earth, and its radius is 11 times the radius of Earth, as we see here. And this mass and this radius translates on the gravity on Jupiter it's basically 2.4 times the gravity on Earth. So this comparison between Earth and Jupiter is really teaching us these kind of proportions that are translated into mass, radius, and then gravity. And also a little bit more complicated, uh, this difference in size is also related to the rotation period. So on Earth, over a day, uh, last for 24 hours, but Jupiter, even if it is much larger, uh, the day in Jupiter, it's only about 10 hours. Okay, so how about equations? That's another major focus that we have in middle school math. Yeah, and equation, our equations are extremely important, not only to solve complex equations, but to also understand how to simplify them in order to, to make progress on understanding nature. Uh, now let me share some of the work that I do and different missions that can also help us to understand how we use equations on the universe. Wonderful. 
So this is a mission, the Juno mission that I've been working on now for six years, the six years that I've been working at NASA. And Juno is this spacecraft that you that you see here, and it's a spinning spacecraft. So every 30 seconds, it, it, it's, it's spin. And I work on an instrument here. And this mission uh, was launched in 2016 to the Jovian system. And what you are seeing here is the launch event where uh, a Juno is inside this rocket that is going to basically launch it to space. And then in the space, it will, Juno will start its trajectory to Jupiter. It took five years to get to Jupiter, but we use a, a massive amount of equation and an amazing team of people who really understand these trajectories, these geometries for um, this uh, trip in the deep space, which I'm going to show in my next slide. So this is maybe a more complex figure, but you see this is Earth, and this is the moment that Juno was launched, August 5th of 2011. And then we have a trajectory that goes into deep space maneuvers. All these maneuvers contains uh, are based in, in complex equations that are, you know, they, they require the specific geometries for these trajectories of the spacecraft. And then uh, Juno went in, 2000, in 2013, did a flyby around Earth. Why? Just to get a boost uh, uh, for, like, let's say, acceleration that will bring the spacecraft even farther until it reaches Jupiter. So all these uh, calculations are made by um, team effort and collaborative efforts to make this happen. So, and I want to highlight that. So it's very important to, to be a team player and to have a team that will put the entire effort to, to get something great, like having Jupiter, having Juno uh, orbiting Jupiter already in 2016. So the orbit of Juno around Jupiter, this little orange uh, thing is Juno, it describes an ellipse around Jupiter. Basically, Juno is trapped by the gravity of Jupiter, and it describes an ellipse. All of these are calculations that have been made in advance, and Juno is programmed to, the, to uh, follow these geometries. So every, uh, in the primary mission uh, a couple of years ago, so since 2016 to 21, 2021, uh, Juno was passing by Jupiter, close to Jupiter, every 53 days. So it took only two hours to go pole to pole, and then it goes farther again, and it goes back. So if we put this into looking at the orbits, that when uh, we have Juno passing through the closest in Jupiter, this is how it looks like. So we have control on where Juno is in every of this orbit in terms of with respect to the clouds of Jupiter to really know where we are. So we use uh, gravity equations, uh, dynamic equations, velocity equations, accelerations, gravity to, to program this orbit. And, and of course, to understand what Jupiter hides inside and why it's important to understand what it hides inside because we have amazing atmospheric uh, events uh, and also Jupiter contains the secrets of the formation of the solar system. So physics basically defines or we use physics to, to describe nature and physics is based in math. So it's extremely important for us to, to work on equations, to work on proportions, and to work on parameters to be able to understand and quantify nature. This is uh, one of my favorite um, videos of Juno. This was uh, basically, this is a visualization based on, on specific data from Juno, GRAM, 
where we see the circumpolar cyclones in the North Pole. So we use these images to basically describe describe the dynamics of these storms. These are huge hurricanes in the North Pole. These uh, hurricanes are, uh, I'm talking about proportions, are several times the size of Earth in some parts. Um, thanks to this data from Juno, you know, we can understand, uh, for example, the wind speed or the rotation or what is this three-dimensional shape uh, of all of these storms? How are they linked to each other? Do they have the same speed? And again, talking about proportions, the winds here are, uh, of course, the much higher, much higher than on Earth. And the minimum wind speed that we have detected in Jupiter, it's already more than double than the highest ever measured on Earth. So it's very exciting. So a couple of things that you said that um, caught my attention. First, you um, spoke, you've mentioned several times about that math um, and physics, because physics uses math, is the way that we understand the world and the universe. And I love that, that um, as far as relevancy goes that makes it really important to understand math and what it is and how we use it so i love that and i'm definitely going to use that with my students <laughs> so, dr marco said math is how we understand the universe so it's important um, the other thing that you um, mentioned reminds me of the math practice standards so we have the content standards that we teach. And then we also have the math practice standards, which are basically um, how teaching the student how to think and work like a mathematician. And you talked about um, collaboration. And I was thinking maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about a few more of the math practice standards um, and how they um, uh, affect what you do um, on with your job. Um, you talked about communication. One of them is um, being able to communicate um, our ideas and asking good questions when you're listening to other people's ideas. So active listening and asking questions. Um, reasoning abstractly and quantitatively and making sense of problems and persevering um, in solving them. So can you speak a little bit about those practice standards and how important you think that they are? They are extremely important because without them, we don't achieve anything. That's how it is. You can be the most intelligent person on the planet. You will not be able to achieve great things. And in, in this, at least I am talking about my, my area, right? Because it requires people of different expertise that come together. And they put the effort together to put a spacecraft first out of Earth and then in Jupiter and then understanding Jupiter, right? So we have uh, a team of engineers engineers, scientists, uh, people doing operations, uh, early career seniors, all the efforts are put together. And I, in terms of my group at NASA, I am very happy because it's a group where I can openly, openly discuss questions. What I have learned is, you know, you, of course, you're not going to know the answer for everything. So you will ask for help and sometimes for brainstorming because nobody knows the answer, right? So that's how we make progress. And sometimes it, yeah, it takes long to solve issues. Let's say uh, we are seeing some weird data coming from you. Know. You are not there to see the spacecraft if something is not working properly. 
you have to work with what you have and it may take months until you discover physically what is happening in the spacecraft or if it's something related to the Jovian environment or to something that you didn't expect and you just don't stop until you find the answer and and of course sometimes it will take longer than others you will fail many times to solve the equation that you need to solve because you may not know which equation that is you need to make it. <laughs> uh, but you just need to be successful once then everything is good <laughs> so perseverance is extremely important uh, teamwork uh, be supportive to your mates and in terms of asking for help and for questions wherever you go you know, they are not dumb questions. They are all important questions for the person who is asking and for everybody. Wow, that's amazing. There's so many um, insights in that. First, I want to um, point out that you have a PhD and you are a scientist with NASA. And you just said that you don't always know the answer. Wow. That's science. I mean, for my students and for all of us, that's wonderful. And it just shows the importance of these math practice standards, not just in math, but in everything that we do. So thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to um, ask you, we talked a little bit before uh, about um, your background and being able to address the needs of all of my learners is critical for me and for all educators. And that includes multilingual learners and students that have special needs and making sure that all students are um, exposed to rigorous content. So could you um, share a little bit about your own story and your insights into how educators can view this? Yeah, so, um, uh, well, I am not a native speaker of English. I am from Spain, so my mother tongue is Spanish. And uh, I was born and, you know, the language I learned was Spanish. And the first time I had the opportunity to speak English was when I was 27 years old. Um, but, you know, I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to work for a high level institution like NASA because I love science. I love the universe. I basically, since I was little, I wanted to understand where I live and where I live is not my city. It's my planet, the solar system and the rest of the universe. And so I, I did my studies in Spain. And when I was doing my PhD, or when I <clears throat> was about to start my PhD, I wanted to do it in a specific topic that was not available in my country. But it was available in the US, and I really wanted to do that. But it was not possible for me because of the language barrier. So I ended up doing a PhD on Antarctic science and geodynamics, where I learned a lot. And I also, it also gave me the opportunity to travel to the U.S. and, and learn English while, while I was doing my PhD. So I learned a lot about other topics that I was not expecting to learn because my idea was different. I wanted to do a different topic. So I learned a lot about the Antarctic studies and all of that that I learned brought me where I am now. So I'm now in the institution I wanted to be, and I'm now doing what I wanted to do for my PhD initially. So now I do what I wanted to do in the past for my PhD, plus everything that I have learned before. So I always like to say that I didn't go in a straight line from A to B. I went to somehow in a curved line. And the important thing is, the path. So that path brought me to that point B with all that new knowledge that I was not expecting. And I'm very grateful for that now. 
And in the universe, the straight line is not the shortest way, it's the curved line. So we, we need well, to address That's wonderful. It, um, that's a really great um, example of having an asset-based approach when we have these students to realize that because they followed that curved line, um, they gained a lot of um, insights and experiences that are an asset to them and that can help them, like you said, achieve great things. And so if we as educators can focus on um, the assets that they have. So thank you for sharing your experiences. That's, that's very insightful and helpful. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit more about some of the other work I know that you not only work on Juno, you have other projects with NASA that you're working on, and I'd love to hear about those and um, how the math that you use. Yeah, so I'm going to show another example. I'm going to share some slides, uh, but just for people to know, although I'm not going to show this here, I work a lot in Antarctica. So I go there, I do field work, you know, and we apply math while we are doing field work <laughs> in, uh, in, in Antarctica. Okay, so I'm going to show uh, some of the work that uh, I, I'm also involved in NASA, and these are terrestrial analogs, uh, sometimes known as planetary analogs. And these are locations on Earth that look like somewhere else in space. It can be Mars, it can be the Moon. And then we assume that past or present similar geology or atmospheric conditions uh, are present. So the picture that you are seeing here this is from Lanzarote. This is in the Canary Islands in Spain, but we could easily say, okay, this looks like Mars. So we go to these kind of locations to test our instruments or, uh, sorry, our instrument or our methods, and then we try to develop techniques to use in other planets. Um, just an example, uh, what we see here, in this top panel is a satellite view of, of Mars and these are vol volcanoes. And what we see here at the bottom is this island in the Canary Islands where we also see the volcanoes. So we can see these similarities. So volcanoes and um, these lava flows when the lava is warm and then it solidifies because it cools down, it creates in many occasions these lava tubes. So there are caves and we know, or, or we, uh, um, from the satellite view, we can see that in the Moon and Mars, it seems that they have also these lava tubes. So we work, we are working, in my, in my team, we are working on designing instruments that will basically find this kind of uh, uh, lava tubes in the Moon um, and Mars. So we go to caves, this is just a, a video, on a cave in California in lava beds that we study. So we go, we measure outside the cave and we also make measurements inside the cave or with different instruments. Um, uh, let me show you, uh, there are other mates from other NASA centers, which also use, you know, rovers where they apply codes and all to, with other instruments to go through these tubes. So we, we do this instrument testing or methodology. And in this video, uh, another colleague and I are making measurements of what is called magnetic susceptibility. This is basically magnetic properties on this cave and we measure every five centimeters. So we try to relate the measurements that we take every five centimeters in one part of the cave to another part of the cave. So we understand how the lava cooled down um, we can relate uh, uh, these measurements with the surface, and, and I will show you how. But uh, let me now show you um, a video from, uh, from Hawaii. This is another place that we go. So all of this that you see is, was warm lava, hot lava, but now it's solidified, and then you see the different kind of lava flows. So we walk over this lava 
to see if we can find the, the lava tubes that uh, I'm gonna uh, show you now. So this lava hot and then it gets cooled down and this is what we see on the surface when it cools down. And then this is one of these lava tubes. So we make measurements from the surface in order to understand the geometry and the depth at which this lava tube is located. Why? Because when we have satellite data from the moon or from Mars, or we have astronauts on the, let's, let's think about the astronauts on the surface, and they are using our instruments that we are developing for them. When they measure, we will have been able to already develop a technique to uh, tell them what is the geometry of this lava tube and the length and how deep it is. It's important to locate these caves because astronauts in the future ideally will use them to hide them from radiation. So that's one. Uh, so we, we are doing all this field work on planetary analogs for the humanities return to the moon. Uh, and that's uh, Well, that is just so fascinating. Um, I think that if my students could see what you do, <laughs> those clips, those videos, um, they, they could see that math can be a very exciting, even adventurous career. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, you can work on the field. What's that? You can work on the field. You don't need to be sitting on a chair to do math. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you've shown us you've gone to lots of exotic places here on Earth, and you're working with things that are in outer space, and all of that is just really exciting and very interesting. Um, I know I've gained a lot from this conversation and getting to know you. Um, I have a better understanding and a better way to communicate with my students about the relevancy of the math content and also of the math practice standards. And so thank you for sharing your expertise and your experience with us. Uh, thank you for counting on me on this. It's very, uh, it's really a pleasure to be part of this. Oh, there is a question from Stephanie. And um, it's for Melissa. So um, that's a really good one. Actually, I found um, that NASA has some really cool um, classroom resources. And we use them um, in our class. And they have them for lots of the different standards. And it was a really fun way to give the students like a, a relevant thing to work on. So that's one of the ways that I am using what I learned with Yasmina. Yeah, that's true. NASA has a lot of resources for schools for any grade. Uh, they are easily and publicly available. Yes, it's very robust, actually, the resources that they have out there. So for measurement, for um, we used it for scale um, at the beginning of this unit, and it was it was really fun. Great, great to hear that. Okay, do we have any other comment or question while we are here? Maybe your students have something to say. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? No. Oh, Candice, I use them during COVID to do science. That's uh, great to hear. Thank you. Yeah, has a lot of yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, I was really excited, actually. I got the idea because of working with Yasmina trying to figure out a good way to, um, you know, introduce scale to the kids and work with them. So I just um, Googled, does NASA use, 
how does NASA use scale or something like that? That came up and it was like, that's awesome. So I can, um, I don't remember the exact address, but I think you can get there from just nasa.org. What are some of your most favorite science math connections? And that question is for me. Uh, that's difficult to say because, yeah, we describe all of our science using math. So it's uh, it just, I love how we can describe physics or gravity or trajectories with equations. Uh, the problem sometimes is to solve them. <laughs> that's, that's when the hard work comes. But it's a... Uh, it's really nice when one gets to solve them. Nice to hear that, Candice, that the, the lessons were engaging for your students. I really have um, instructions on how to use them and everything, so that's really nice. I uh, hope to see you guys doing a lot of math eh, very soon. Yes. <laughs> we'll have to find a way for you to virtually visit our class sometime. Yeah. Yeah, sure. She lives in. Um, is it? Where's the um? Where do you live, Dr. Moros? It's Virginia, or I'm in Greenbelt. It's very uh, close to DC. Yeah. Can you give a specific example of when you needed to solve a math problem in your job? Um, one of the most difficult that I had to, to solve was with the Juno spacecraft uh, when we were receiving data. So Juno is a spinning spacecraft. Um, we thought it was spinning on the specific axis, but after we received data, we um, after a lot of work, we understood that this was not really rotating on that axis it was slightly deviated. So it was calculating that angle between the real spin axis and the, and the theoretical spin axis. And that took a while to, to really solve it, although it's simply calculating an angle. Yes, uh, not only, not only so the questions from Stephanie, I also like to know if solving a math problem usually leads to a discovery of something new. Or it usually leads, for example, to even new equations, because you are trying to describe nature using an equation that it may not exist by the time. So you need to come back to come up with that equation to describe nature. Um, and so you basically uh, create the equation and then solve it. Oh, my students, the bell rang. And they said goodbye to Dr. Martos. Oh, okay. <laughs> a little loud, so letting me know. They said goodbye, Dr. Martos. Yes, yeah, so it seems like we are at, now at the end of the session. So we we need to say bye to to everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yasmin. It was so much fun to work with you. And uh, thank, thank you, so Melissa. It has been great. Yeah. So we, we keep in touch. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.